today's lecture is about anatomy. Nobody likes to talk about anatomy. It's always something boring our, during our medical school and residency. But for abdominal wall surgery, it's kind of the real basic knowledge that we all need to understand before going to do surgery. So I tried to do something more uh, applied to our surgery, not the basic anatomy issues, but more information that is really important during surgery. And we can go over for the, for the next 30 minutes on that information. Uh, as, as usual, uh, this initiative is under uh, BDI sponsorship, so we need to disclose that everything that we're going to discuss has this huge uh, disclosure. But uh, as you may know in this presentation, we are not uh, going to discuss any BDI product or anything that will impact in our information. See, so the agenda that we have for today is three main topics. One, we're going to begin real fast with what is important in the uh, anterolateral part or region of the abdominal wall and its anatomy. And then we are going to move to open inguinal anatomy. And then in the end, we're going to re review the inguinal anatomy by a posterior approach for the laparoscopic uh, repairs. This statement is uh, 500 years old, but it's clear, clearly uh, appropriate for uh, surgery and anatomy. Uh, if we don't know anatomy, we are blind during uh, our surgery. So we really need to understand anatomy to do a correct surgery. Talking about the abdominal wall, we can uh, understand the abdominal uh, region with, uh, as a cylinder with four walls, and we are going to discuss mainly the anterolateral. We are not going to discuss the superior, that will be the diaphragm, the inferior, that will be the, the pelvic floor, and the posterior, that will be the paralumbar uh, muscles and the spine. We are going to discuss the anterolateral muscles and anatomy. What is beautiful about abdominal wall uh, anterolateral anatomy that is very dynamic, so allowed us to have really stretchy extension, flexion, torsion of our abdominal wall, and that's very important to keep our movements and our day-by-day -day survival. Um, <clears throat> talking about the first muscle that we have in front is the rectus abdominis. Is uh, and I imagine that you all will remember uh, med school is a polygastric muscle. What does does that mean? Is that it's not just a tendon insertion, the muscle belly, and another tendon insertion. We have different and uh, several tendon insertion during the muscle belly. That is what makes a polygastric muscle. And that's important because when you cut a regular muscle, it will retract to both ends of the tendon insertions. If you have a polygastric muscle, you can cut the muscle and it, it would only retract to the next of uh, tendon insertion. So we, we, we will not have a full retraction of the muscle. That's why we can do transverse incisions on the rectus without any big further damage to the abdominal wall. So if the rectus abdomen was not a uh, polygastric muscle, we do a transverse incision and we will we'll have a full defect on the, on, on the anterior region. That's, that's why it's so important to have a polygastric uh, muscle. Um, talking about the rectal abdomen, as we have, uh, as we, you all know, anterior and posterior sheets of the muscle. But they, they have a different setup the, uh, depending on the height in the abdominal wall that we study them. What we know is that when we are on the superior three fifths, and it's hard to uh, measure the, uh, or divide in fifth the, the rectal muscle, though. so that's why we roughly say that. Uh, superiorly to the umbilicus and inferior to umbilicus. Uh, so superior to umbilicus, or best saying, superiorly to the arc of Douglas or the arcuate line that we can see right here. Uh, this is roughly one or two centimeters below the umb umb umbilicus. That's why we always say it's easier to understand that below the umbilicus is one thing and, uh, and superior to umbilicus is another setup. So superiorly to the arcuate line or the umbilicus, we have the lateral muscles. There are the external oblique, the internal oblique, and the transverse. They send fibers to create the anterior sheet. Uh, 
from the external oblique and part of internal oblique, and the posterior sheet, part of the internal oblique and the transverse. So we have an anterior sheet and a posterior sheet. Below the arcuate line, or roughly the umbilicus, we have no posterior sheet. We have all muscles sent fibers to, do, to create anterior sheet. Another uh, landmark that we have here is the semilunar line that is the lateral limit of the posterior sheet. The, here it goes. So this setup has to be in our minds. But that is how we learn in the anatomic books on the atlas. But what we see in real life, and see, this is some information that I want to give you right now, but we're going to need it uh, further on our lectures when we're going to discuss different uh, ventral open approach, is that the real life is not actually the same what we see in, uh, in the anatomical atlas. So here we have a CT scan and we can check it out, the external oblique, internal oblique and transverse. And as you can note, the transverse usually extends itself under the rectus muscles. So the transverse does not end quite with the internal oblique. And that's a very important uh, knowledge uh, for posterior ventral repairs as ribs and as posterior component separation um, known as TAR. So here we see internal oblique giving some fibers to create a posterior sheet and gathering together with transverse muscle and then creating a posterior sheet. Here will be the same lunar line. Okay? The <coughs> fibrous uh, arrangements are very interesting, are quite interesting in the anterior uh, abdominal wall. We have uh, different layers of the lateral muscles. As I just said, we have three lateral muscles and they align differently. The external oblique, that is what we can see here, is oblique, as the na name says, but is from superiorly to inferiorly coming from lateral to medial. So as I usually say, it's like the hand in the pocket. It's like this, the hand in your pocket are the fibers of the external oblique. The internal oblique is the opposite. So it will be up. If we're talking about left size, this will be external oblique and this will be internal oblique. They are the, they are the opposite. So they kind of align with the contralateral muscle. As you can see in this picture, this is external oblique from, from the right, and this is internal oblique from the left. They kind of align on the midline, but on the same side, they are opposite. And the transverse is transverse, as the, the name says. So all those fibers create a triple uh, arrangement that covers and give us, uh, give the, uh, uh, give us dynamics in our movements on the abdominal wall. Um, quickly, uh, talking about vascularization and innervation, we have two systems of vascularization or two ways of vascularization in abdominal wall. One is, is the torque abdominal arteries that goes transversally. They come from laterally with the nerves together and in a vascularize the muscles until the rectal sheet. And we have a, a Another system there are the, the epigastric vessels that runs longitudinally, anteriorly, uh, from superiorly and inferiorly. We have anterior and posterior uh, branch of the epigastric vessels. So mainly the superior epigastric vessels and the inferior epigastric vessels that are more known as we usually we can see those are posterior. We can see during dissection, during surgery, and those uh, epigastric vessels create anastomosis. And we have so two systems, a longitudinal system and horizontal um, system. In the version, we, have just, we just have one system that is uh, the intercostal nerves that run on the transverse uh, aspect or the orientation from posterior to anterior. So those are the main key points on vascularization and innervation. Changing gears now from the anterior abdominal wall to the inguinal anatomy, we are, are, we are going to go through 
some beautiful pictures and, and drawings, trying to understand the open anatomy, and then we are going to move to check the posterior or laparoscopic uh, anatomy. Uh, going from outside to inside, after we cut the skin, the first anatomic landmark that we see is a very thin areolar fascia that we call camper. Uh, it's not, sometimes not uh, very easy to identify, but it's because it's very thin. Once we go over it, we have the lamellar or scapular fascia. This is usually more easily, more e e e it's easier to identify, is because it's thicker. So we can check this fascia on the subcutaneous uh, tissue, and then we are going to expose the external oblique muscle. So we are going to see the external oblique muscle and the opening that ha that that happens on the external oblique that is the superficial inguinal orifice. So the superficial inguinal orifice is, or external inguinal orifice, is an opening in the external oblique, as we can check here. We have to understand the innovation for open uh, surgery. Um, we have three main nerves. Two of them are easier to identify. This will be the iliohypogastric and the ilioinguinal. We can check here that the iliohypogastric comes laterally. Usually we see it on the top of the internal oblique, but sometimes it has a intramuscular pathway and it comes and raises and go into the rectal sheet. The ilioinguinal nerve goes along the cord, and we can see here, runs on the top, usually on the top of the, of the cord, and is the easiest one to identify during surgery. The third nerve will be the genital branch of the genital femoral, is a really thin nerve that goes posteriorly to, on the, on the uh, inguinal funiculum, posteriorly, very thin, and we can identify a little vessel along it, so we call the blue line, and that will be the genital branch of the genital femoral. Uh, ligaments. We have a, a lot of ligaments on this region. The most famous ones are the inguinal ligament. This is just a fold on the external oblique. We have the cuprous ligament, or the pectineal ligament, that is on top of the pubis. And we have the lacunar, or gibernate ligament, that is, is a connection between those two. And this lacunar ligament is important when we do uh, femoral repairs. So, as we can check here, uh, all those pictures, before I forget, are from Leandro Totti Cavazola from Brazil. He is an anatomist and he kindly uh, provides us all those high definition pictures of opening anatomy to make easier the, the learning of, the, of, the, of that anatomy. So, here we can see the external oblique was opened and we see this fold inferior fold of the external oblique, that would be the, the uh, inguinal ligament. When it curves down, when moving towards the pubis, we have, when it turns down, we call the lacunar ligament. So now, once we open the external oblique, we have the internal oblique and the transverse muscle. When we do open surgery, inguinal open surgery, we treat them as one. So we call the conjoint tendon, that would be the, the union of the transverse muscle with the internal oblique muscle. But as we can check here, we have the transversal fascia, that is the floor of the inguinal canal. This is the inguinal ligament. And here, this line shows us what is above. This is the conjoint tendon, that will be the internal oblique plus the transverse uh, muscle. Again, we can check it out here, the, the posterior floor of the inguinal canal is, uh, is, is transversalis fascia. Here is the inguinal ligament, and behind the cord, we can see the transverse uh, or, or the conjoint tendon, that is the transverse and the oblique and uh, the internal oblique together. We have the orifice, the external orifice, as I just said before, is this opening the external oblique muscle. The internal orifice in the top of the inguinal canal 
is where we can see rising the elements of the cord and together uh, outside we see the uh, chromosteric muscle and we we cut it take it out uh, the, the 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 cord we are going to see the full anatomy of the inguinal canal the conjoint tendon there is again internal oblique plus transversus the floor is a transversal fascia the inguinal ligament the pectinal ligament is deep there's the cuprous ligament and between them tiny little one will be the lacunar one so the Hasselbach triangle, the famous Hasselbach triangle, where we can see the direct harness, is composed by the epigastric vessels, the rectal sheets on the medial, and the inguinal ligament inferiorly. So that triangle is what we call Hasselbach triangle, exactly as Fruchot described it. So here and here we have a Hasselbach triangle, as we know today, epigastric vessels, inguinal ligament and rectal sheet is the medial uh, edge of the triangle. The other orifice that we should know is the femoral orifice that is inferiorly to the inguinal ligament. So if the patient has a hernia that is inferiorly uh, is, is inferior to the inguinal ligament, that is not an inguinal hernia, that is a femoral or a crural hernia. Putting together the, all the defects that we can find on the inguinocrural area, direct, indirect, and femoral, we call that area that we can find those three defects that will be here in the deep ring, here in the Hasselbach triangle, and here posteriorly, inferiorly to the inguinal ligament, this will be the femoral, all that region we call the myopectinal orifice of Fruchot. That's what it means to uh, say that it's a myopectinal orifice. Again, we just ran over the open inguinal anatomy. Now we have to understand the same anatomy by a posterior view. That's the anatomy that the open surgeons that are used to do stopa or knee hose repair will uh, understand but it's absolutely the anatomy that the surgeons that would like to do laparoscopic or even robotic surgery needs to learn and, and, and understand very well is the posterior inguinal anatomy and that's what we are going to go through right now. Every time I put that slide, everybody sees a lot of names, a lot of structures and say, come on, it will be impossible to understand all those names and all those structures. And there's a lot of things that we should know on that uh, anatomy, but to keep it simple, I usually say that if you can identify three and only three structures on that posterior anatomy, usually you have already identified everything that is important. And I would like to go with you over this. And those three elements will be the epigastric vessels, the vas deferent, and the spermatic vessels. So if you can identify those three structures and only those three structures, probably you have all the anatomy already done. And just take your time to review it and everything will be set. So you'll be ready to put uh, the mesh. So that is the idea of the inverted Y and five triangles. That's the idea that Marcelo Furtado from Brazil uh, developed. And we, are try we, we sent to publication this and, and soon we'll have the published paper exactly on this anatomy review. But what do I mean when I say inverted Y and five triangles? So here we have a drawing of the posterior uh, inguinal anatomy. And I want you to try to see this is a right region. I want you to see the epigastric vessels, the, the vas deferent, and the spermatic vessels. That creates that shape that is an inverted Y or a Mercedes-Benz a sign or however you want to call it but you have to have this in your mind the inverted Y shape of the epigastric vessels the vas deferent medially and the spermatic vessels laterally that is the image that you need to have in your mind besides that you have to imagine uh, a line that will cut our field in anterior and posterior will divide our field in anterior and posterior and that line will run from the pubis, you can touch the pubis during the surgery, you can see the pubis, 
and your lateral edge or limit of this dissection is the anterior superior uh, iliac spine. So if you, you can feel from the outside the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubis and the line between those two bony structures is what divides your field in anterior and posterior. That line is the iliopubic tract. What outside translates to the inguinal ligament. So that line between the pubis and the anterior superior spine, uh, iliac spine is the uh, iliopubic tract outside inguinal ligament. And that divides anterior and posterior. So with the inverted Y and that inguinal ligament or iliopubic tract, we can divide the field in five triangles. And let's go over them. The first one is between the vas deferent and the spermatic vessels. There's the triangle of death or doom. We have the external iliac vessel. The next triangle between the spermatic vessel and that line is the pain triangle when we can find the, the nerves. The third triangle between the iliopubic tract and the spermatic and the epigastric vessels is the indirect triangle. So where we can find the indirect corneas. The fourth triangle between the epigastric vessels back to the pubis is Hasselbach triangle, the famous Hasselbach triangle seen from inside. That is epigastric vessels, rectal sheet, and that line that means the inguinal ligament, that exactly the Hasselbach triangle. And the fifth and smallest triangle between the pubis that, uh, you know, or the uh, iliopubic tract back to the vas deferent is the femoral triangle where we can see or we can find the crural or femoral hernias. So that's an easy way to, to, to imagine in, in your mind the anatomy. Find the three structures, epigastric vessels, spermatic vessels, and vas deferent. Imagine the inverted Y divide your field in anterior posterior with the iliopubic tract that runs from the pubis to the anterior superior iliac spine and see the five triangles and that way you're going to find everything that you need again the same anatomy we are going to go over and over now in real pictures uh, before that's the beauty of a top when you begin a tap, and we are going to discuss in further lectures the two uh, techniques, when you begin a tap, you don't see the old anatomy. When you begin a tap, usually you can see a lot of structures. So again, here, we can see the spermatic, the epigastric vessels, we can see the vas deferent, we can see the spermatic, uh, spermatic vessels, we can see the Hasselbach triangle right here, we can imagine where is the pubis, we can imagine where are the nerves, we can imagine where are the uh, external iliac vessels, we see the internal inguinal orifice, so we can see a lot without even beginning the dissection. We, we draw the line, the divide the field anterior and posterior, and we can check it out, the five triangles. Again, doom or death triangle, external iliac vessels, pen triangle with the nerves, indirect hernia triangle, direct hernia triangle or Hasselbach triangle, and femoral triangle, where you have the crural or femoral hernias. We have, with that division, with that inverted Y, we have three main operative fields or zones. One will be the lateral, when we can find the nerves and psoas. One will be the medial, when we can find the bladder down and the coopers and the direct hernias. And the medial or the central uh, uh, zone, better say, is we can find the elements of the cords and the, the big vessels, the big external iliac vein in artery. So with that idea, we can, tr we can try to dissect everything that we need. Again, the same idea epigastric vessels, vas deferent, spermatic vessels, are inverted Y, we have the deep inguinal orifice, we can divide the field in medial or lateral, this division is mainly to identify a direct 
uh, or uh, indirect hernia. And that line is important to draw and divide your field in anterior posterior. This division for me is very important because everything that can put you in a big trouble usually is posterior. You have the bladder, you have the intestine, you have the vas deferens, you have the spermatic vessels, you have the external iliac vessels, so everything that can put you, you and your patient for, for, for sure in, in danger is posterior. Anything that is anterior, the only thing anterior that can give you in trouble are the epigastric vessels, but it will be just a ligation and solve your problem. So pay attention every time you are dissecting something posterior and, and have this in mind that you can get in trouble. Again, the same anatomy, the death triangle between the vas deferens and spermatic vessels and the pen triangle between the vas, uh, the spermatic vessels and the uh, uh, iliopelvic tract. Take it out the peritoneum, we have seen the anatomy now better. We can now make the exercise to identify the epigastric vessels, epigastric vessels, vas deferens, spermatic vessels, one triangle, two triangles, three triangles, four triangles, five triangles. This, sometimes when the patient is very thin, we can see, actually see the iliopubic uh, tract. It's not as always, but this patient we can see. And we can see the space of the femoral hernia. We can see the weakness here in the posterior uh, wall of the inguinal canal, the Hasselbach, the direct, and we can see the inguinal orifice. So that's the anatomy. We put a mesh, we identify, as I just said, oh, we put a mesh and we fix it if needed. We avoid fixation on this part because here we have all the, the structures of the core, the big vessels and the nerves. So that's why we don't fixate in the first and second triangle, never. And only fixation if needed on the other triangles. So to wrap up uh, this anatomical review, we need to understand how the rectus abdominus is composed with anterior and posterior sheet and the lateral uh, muscles and their fiber uh, setup. The innervation is very important. The intercostal nerves that run along between the transverse and the internal oblique. Uh, understand the open anatomy in all the ligaments and the innervation as well, that's important and the lap anatomy or posterior anatomy, the inverted Y, uh, the anterior posterior division of the field and the five triangles. So thank you for your attention on this lecture. Uh, make sure that you answer our post lecture quiz and questions. And don't forget to register, register yourself to our live Q&A session that we have in a few days about that topic that we just discussed.